Hi, this is He Jinzong from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the National University of Singapore. The research interest of my lab is to explore the anaerobic microbial world to make discoveries that advance the scientific understanding of mechanisms and mechanisms responsible for biotransformation and fermentation of environmental pollutants and biomass residues. One of my research topic focuses on converting biomass to biochemicals to meet the ever-increasing demands for cleaner biochemicals and biofuels. Over the past several years, my research group has been working on discovering new strengths that hold promise in generating several biochemical and biofuel-related products from different carbon sources such as food waste, starch, and lignocellulosic biomass. However, utilization of lignocellulosic biomass being composed of both 5 and 6 carbon sugars is challenging, considering the fact that sovinogenic bacteria in general prefer to utilize 6 carbon sugar only. The major breakthrough in this regard was obtained in my lab with the discovery of a strain BOG3, which can simultaneously utilize both 5 and 6 carbon sugars. Strain BOG3 is particularly interesting since it produces similar amount of butanol from both glucose and xylose. Particularly for xylose, it produces significantly larger amount of riboflavin, another commercially important product. To conduct in-depth understanding about the proteomics of strain BOG3, we collaborated with Dr. Lin Qingsong and his team at the Protein and Proteomics Center at the National University of Singapore. The subsequent experimental design, along with the major findings, which is a subject of our upcoming paper in biotechnology and bioengineering, would now be discussed by Dr. Basu. Hello, I'm Anil Basu and I'm going to talk about our upcoming paper as told by Prof. Herb. As already discussed, apart from its capability to utilize both 5 and 6 carbon sugars, the most important aspect about our strain BH3 was its capability to produce riboflavin at higher titers whilst maintaining similar butanol yields under xylose fed conditions. Availability of a commercially important entity like riboflavin as a byproduct is particularly interesting from bioprocess economics point of view which urged us to pursue an in-depth understanding of the biology of the bacteria. A nitrate-based proteomics investigation was therefore performed with these bacteria at different stages of fermentation. Samples were taken at different time points from the fermentation bottle, late anthracytic phase and mid-solventatic phase. In this study, an eight-plex iTrack kit was used to label the bacterial proteins as shown in this figure such that different iTrack ratios could yield valuable information like the expression ratio of proteins at different stages of fermentation whilst using glucose and xylose as the carbon source, as well as review substrate-specific proteome dynamics. Through our iTrack experiments, we were able to quantify expression ratios of approximately 20% of the total proteome of the bacterial cell as shown in figure 4. The quantified proteins were found to be well distributed within all classes of the COF classification, indicating the possibility of capturing detailed metabolic changes within the bacteria through our experimental results. However, since our focus in this study was to understand the machineries involved in xylose uptake and riboflavin production, we focused on certain classes of proteins for the sake of simplicity. A closer study of the COF C proteins related to energy metabolism indicated the upregulation of several flavoproteins within the xylose fed BH3 cells. Alongside, we also observed some proteins represented as of cluster C3 in this figure, which were downregulated in the xylose fed cultures during solventing phase. Interestingly, we found that this cluster consisted of proteins belonging to the electron transport chain of the bacteria, which was further supported by the flow cytometric data of the samples where we could observe a significant bacterial population to be metabolically inactive due to the loss of the electron transport chain function. 
with regard to the riboflavin production, we also found all proteins related to riboflavin production pathway to be upregulated within the valid cell cultures as shown in figure 6. Interestingly, riboflavin production within the cells decreased with increase in ferrous ion concentration within the culture media, indicating that riboflavin produced by the bacteria is actually involved in iron uptake. Coming back to proteins involved in xylose utilization, we found two distinct operands to be upregulated within the xylose with cultures, namely CAG1341-249 and CAG2610-213. The CAG1341-249 operon seems to be particularly important since it contains a xylose importer. This operon, however, remains under the negative control of the CCPA protein, represented as CAG3037 over here, which is a known catabolic repressor protein producing pleiotropic functions within the cellular metabolism. Contrary to the other studies related to clostridial fermentation, this protein did not show any signs of regulation between the glucose and salicylate cultures, thereby indicating that it remains relatively suppressed under salicylate conditions. Another important observation for the case of salicylate cultures is the upregulation of several iron containing proteins related to redox stress, particularly in the solventogenic phase. Simultaneously, we also observed regulation of several sporulation related genes within the xylose fed bacteria at its solventogenic phase. Our observations thus indicate that strain BH3 is highly capable of uptaking xylose and regulating its metabolic machineries when exposed to the 5 carbon sugar owing to the apparent repression of the inhibitory CCPA protein. Such a metabolic setup helps to efficiently utilize xylose on the one hand, on the other hand, it leads to increased iron demands leading to higher riboflavin production under various restricted conditions. Such metabolic consequences can ultimately result in increased cellular oxidative stress which can be detrimental particularly during the solventogenic phase when the bacteria are already being exposed to gradually increasing solvent stress. Hence, we propose that future metabolic engineering studies on clostridial strains should focus on methods to manage the stresses within the target of varicels so as to improve the general production on the one hand and riboflavin on the other. For further details regarding the study, you can refer to our paper in Biotechnology and Bioengineering. Hope you enjoy reading it. Happy reading!